folks, this is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, and today I'm talking to you, teaching you about Jesus and the Sabbath. Uh, this is a tremendous, tremendously important topic in the four Gospels because this is one of the main reasons why Jesus was eventually crucified. It wasn't just his blasphemy, so-called. <clears throat> it was also his unwillingness to follow the Jewish, that is the Pharisaic, interpretation of the Sabbath laws and their other laws. So here's the text. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? that is, they work, and they are blameless. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, that is, he viewed the disciples as without guilt. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and he was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. <clears throat> so Jesus assumed the lordship of all the things over which he had power and domination. And in particular, he assumed the lordship over the interpretation of the Old Testament. As we read in Matthew chapter 7, he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes and Pharisees. So for just a moment, let's look at what the Sabbath was in the Old Testament. It originated in Genesis chapter 2 when God actually began the Sabbath rest. Genesis chapter 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now, the Hebrew word means rest or cessation, and a few have connected it also with the word seventh, which of course fits, because the day of rest is the seventh day. In the law, this is the Ten Commandments. It's the law of the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day, says the Lord to Moses, through Moses. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger which is it, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens the earth, and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. In addition, the Jewish holidays were Sabbaths and inherited the same rules as the weekly Sabbath. 
And this is immensely important, folks, because basically Judaism, as far as its calendar, was built around the Sabbath or the Sabbaths. So the Pharisees had a special use for the Sabbath laws. They were used as a form of control for the common people because the Sabbath was a hugely important concept in the Jewish calendar. In fact, it was so important that the Pharisees created many rules to safeguard the Old Testament Sabbath laws. In some cases, these rules merely made it difficult to follow the law and promoted evil rather than good, and this is what we see in the Gospels. Now, the Pharisees' love of their rules is why Jesus was excoriated for doing good on the Sabbath days, and why the disciples received their ire for plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath. The Pharisees loved their rules, but they also loved not to obey them. For example, there was a rule about how far you could go from your home on the Sabbath that was about 3,000 feet, 2,000 cubits to be more precise. It was laid out by the Pharisees, but they also decreed that as long as there was an item from your home in the road, in other words, something put there from your house, say a shoe, you could go to that item, then take another Sabbath day's journey beyond it, where, of course, there was another item placed there by a servant a day or two before. The more enterprising Pharisees, of course, had a servant go and put items at the road in specific distances so that on the Sabbath the Pharisee could go wherever he wanted. In other words, many of the Pharisees loved to impose rules they would never follow used them as a control device for the rest of their society. Now, of course, there were good people among the Pharisees, but the majority were, as Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 2. And so here is Matthew 23 and what Jesus, at the end of his ministry, said about the Pharisees. And this was the thing that finally got their goat and made them decide to kill him. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes, that is, all the crowds, and his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they are the inheritor of Moses' authority. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. The Pharisees hated Jesus, and Matthew 12 is an example of their controversy with him. We, there are lots of other examples, but here we have the disciples, totally innocent, being taken to task for eating a few handfuls of grain to stave off their hunger. And by the way, the penalty for breaking the Sabbath was death. That's an amazing thing if you think about it. The Pharisees taught that grabbing such grain off of the st grain stalks was work and not permitted because they handled it with their hands and pulled it from the grain stalks. Now, by the way, eating grain off the stalks was permitted in the law. Harvesting it was not, so you couldn't put a sickle or a scythe into the grain field, ever. But any day you needed, you could walk through those fields and grab some grain. The healing of the man with the withered hand is similar. The Pharisees held that when Jesus healed, he was working. Jesus' point was that doing good on the Sabbath day was lawful. It should even be praised. And he healed many people on the Sabbath day. John 5, John 9, um, lots of works done on the Sabbath here in uh, Matthew chapter 12 and a bunch of other places because it was a congregation day. In other words, people got together on that day and 
and if there were sick people there he healed them now let's talk for a few minutes as an aside about the sabbath in the new testament when we move past the four gospels the sabbath gets little mentioned except that paul reasoned in the sabbath in the synagogues so why is there so little mention well there are several reasons but the most important is found in acts chapter 15. as the story goes legal scholars in other words pharisees came from jerusalem into the church at antioch which was a gentile church by that time and told the gentiles that they must be circumcised and keep the law of moses to be saved now paul and barnabas fervently disagreed with this and the church at antioch sent them to jerusalem to determine this issue with the apostles now there was a great deal of argument over this and i recommend that you read acts 15 with paul and barnabas testifying that the gentiles had believed in jesus as lord and didn't need to keep jewish law interestingly this was also the experience of peter and Peter rose up during this council and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's in Acts chapter 10. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith now in acts 10 when this occurred when the gentiles received the holy spirit and you'll read in there that the holy spirit fell on everyone who held the who heard the word and they believed and then they spoke in tongues when this occurred the jews who came with peter were sort of forced to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit was given on the basis of faith in Jesus as Lord without any works required. That's a very important point. God superseded all of the statements that the Jews believed were important in the law and finding salvation by their works. He said, no, that's not necessary. These guys believed in me and therefore I'm going to save them, give them the Holy Spirit, and purify their hearts by faith. So Paul and Barnabas then added to this by giving the results of their own ministry, which accorded exactly with Peter's. Then James stood up. It says, and after they, Paul and Barnabas, had become silent, James answered, saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Peter has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it, as it is written. After this, God says, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And of course, James is referring to the appearance of Jesus on the scene. I will rebuild its ruins and will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. That's James' statement. Therefore I judge, says James, that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And then he adds this, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath, thus making a huge distinction between the law of Moses and the preaching of the gospel. This decision, by the way, in which the other leaders concurred, ended the argument about keeping the law of Moses, at least it, it did for the apostles. 
we see it arise again in Paul's letters, and he arise and he addresses it by always referring to the advocates of Moses' law as a means of salvation, as promoting a different false gospel from the true gospel. In Galatians 1.8, he says, Even though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. There is no mention of the Sabbath in the Jerusalem decree. There is none. The Sabbath is not promoted in the New Testament letters at all. It's gone, except when it's used as a preaching day when the Apostle Paul used it to find Jews who truly worshipped God and could therefore be converted to believe in the Lord Jesus. While many Old Testament commands are repeated in the, in the New Testament, the Sabbath is not. Why? Well, it's no longer a requirement, folks. You don't have to keep the Sabbath to be saved. And that was the point the Jews were making. You had to keep the Sabbath to be saved. I should say the Pharisees, because Paul, of course, was a Jew. Now, this is one of the reasons that Jesus was crucified. He messed with their holy days. He messed with all of the things that the Pharisees used to keep the people under their thumb. And you'll find throughout the four Gospels that there was this underlying controversy. The Sabbath, as it was intended, a day of rest and worship for mankind to enjoy, the Jews, versus the Pharisaic notion that they controlled the laws and their application. They believed that their interpretation of the laws was actually the word of God, just as the truth was the word of God just as the Old Testament was. Now, we see, in, we see this in many places and every time in Christian history, as well as Jewish history, that additions become more important than what God actually says. We see a gigantic deterioration in faith and godly living. This is extremely important because when you add to the Word of God, basically what you do is you dilute it. You destroy its impact and its power, and you make something else better than the Word of God. This is what always happens throughout history. It has never been different, and every single revival, every revival, involves a move back to the Bible, and specifically the New Testament. Why? Because people want truth, not hypocrisy and corruption. So, folks, read your Bible, read the Old Testament, and follow the New Testament. Develop the truths you see in the Bible for your own life. Apply those truths to your own life. Pay no attention to the hypocrites who add to the Word of God. God knows them, and He will judge them in due time. And additionally, if you're involved in a ministry that adds to the Bible, be careful. The Bible is the thing. It is how we determine the direction of our life. It is the truth. It is the Word of God. It is superior to all of the additions, all of the interpretations, all of the things that are said about it. It is the key. And use the key in your life, folks. If you are involved in a ministry that adds to the Bible, be very careful to pay attention to the scriptures. You will soon find, if you are in that kind of a ministry, that the additions become more important than the Bible. Don't go that route. Stick with the Word of God, because it is the truth. Hope God blesses you today and fills your life with his joy and gives you great grace in that life. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.